Baroness Garden, ladies and gentlemen, members, it's a great honour for me to be asked to do this, Sue, and a privilege. So it is in very much in memory of Tim, who I did know well. We both did the Masters of Philosophy course at the University of Cambridge as serving officers, um, where we were both tutored by Dr. Philip Toll, who's recently retired, and we were both directors of Defence Studies of the Royal Air Force, and Tim very much influenced me in my thinking in that role. And perhaps more importantly for tonight, uh, we were both what I would like to call, and I will explain this later, joint officers. Uh, I've now completed seven joint appointments, including the Chief of Joint Operations, the Head of Military Intelligence, the Commander of the Joint Forces Command, and now the Vice Chief of Defence Staff. And I know Tim was also a joint officer, and I think he was also always very fresh in his thinking, prepared to embrace new ideas and to try and move with the times we're in, rather than, as often the military are accused of, looking backwards. And of course, later in his life, Tim was very distinguished, both in academe, at this place, which he loved, and of course in politics. You'll be delighted to hear I'm not going to talk about politics tonight. But of course, Tim was always, as a, ju as a junior and as a senior officer in the Royal Air Force, and as a defence officer and as a joint officer, who was always interested in the world. And geostrategically, the world, of course, is changing. And you can see it on the TV screens, you can see it on the internet, you can see it in your own travels. And as our Secretary of State, Philip Hammond, was in the Shangri-La Dialogue by another organisation in London uh, last week in Singapore, the shift to Asia is now real. Much predicted, probably in this room, maybe by some of you, but it's now very real. And that comes, comes with that all sorts of issues in Asia, which may well yet have security implications, including potentially issues between states. It was rather fashionable for a while to talk about those state-on-state -state type issues, in, even in places like this and the Royal College of Defence Studies, not far away, and RUSI, that these issues may well have diminished, but probably not. And of course, we see before us the sectarian nature of many conflicts and the ferocity of those conflicts literally unfolding before us in Syria and elsewhere. We also see this, the sub-state group, the group that doesn't really play by the rules, a theme I will return to, that doesn't abide by any known norms, but is quite happy to embrace technology as presented. We also see the breakdown of cohesion that, that both sectarian conflict and these sub-state groups can cause and can inflame. Often in places in the world where people have lived cheek by jowl, side by side, as neighbours for hundreds if not thousands of years. So the shifts and the changes are very real. We've seen it across the so-called Arab Spring and we've seen it elsewhere. So even if the number of conflicts are reducing, the ferocity and the nature of them is still very violent. The so what from all that is, of course, if you then mould in the resource com competition aspects of our world, be it for minerals or resources or water, and or the competition around technology, access and use, and the use that, for example, international extremists and terrorist groups use the internet frequently, if not totally, then this is a very... Uh, uncertain time. And of course, Tim, in his time in the military, wrote about this. And I have, uh, I had both of his books. And they are still very well written and very taught. Both his first book, which was influenced by Corelli Barnett, his tutor when he was doing the M. Phil at Cambridge, on deterrence, and his second book, which I will actually talk about in a little bit more detail at the end, called The Technology Trap published by Brasses in 1989, is a surprisingly refreshing read, but also very topical. Now here, the so what from the world we're in, I think Tim would have approved of us now having a National Security Council. It's a good thing. So we now have a structure in the heart of the British government that deals with security at the national level. And we have a national security strategy, which we in the Ministry of Defence contribute to where we will use all of our national capabilities to, you, to build UK prosperity, to extend our influence and strengthen our security. 
Now, these are not just words, and I can say one thing on the, on, on the record, of course, is as the operational commander during the NATO operation in Libya two years ago, the National Security Council, then very new and young, was very active in managing that crisis or managing that situation. We've developed further strategies. Again, I think Tim would have liked them. The one I think that is finding its feet quickly is the International Defence Engagement Strategy, which I think would chime with Chatham House, which is the Ministry of Defence and the Foreign Office working closely in countries through embassies and high commissions on engagement and on upstream capacity building and on how to engage with the militaries of other countries and so on. Building stability overseas with the DFID element is another example of a subordinate strategy to the, uh, the overall national security strategy. And the word strategy, perhaps, I do agree with Hugh Strawn, we need to be cautious about. Uh, you know, it is overused in our idiom these days, and, and there is a risk it loses its meaning, but the national security strategy certainly justifies that word. What else are we doing that is a change from former times is we now engage in defense diplomacy, guided by country plans, guided by the ambassador and the high commissioner, but it is a real thing, and we're getting better at it. We've still got a long way to go. Uh, we still need to do better at language training and cultural awareness, but we are doing that. And one thing I would say, and I speak now as a former commander, the first commander of the Joint Forces Command, is the UK Defense Academy, which I know Tim would have approved of, where we've concentrated uh, the, the staff colleges and subordinate courses, the higher command course, an excellent library in a lovely setting down at Shrivenham, now a decade old, has definitely found its feet. And my contention, certainly here at Chatham House, would be we don't actually perhaps value it enough as a national asset, which it is, and it has, if, if uh, the enthusiasm of others to join us in the Defence Academy of the United Kingdom is any measure, then we would be absolutely overwhelmed with overseas students. So maybe we're getting something right. So I think professional military education in this uncertain world is a very important point. Which leads me to my theme for tonight, really, Sue, which is we are, I am, as the Vice Chief of Defence Staff, the first to say the, the UK Armed Forces have to modernise and learn, modernise and learn for the world we're in. We have a great deal of operational experience now. Our young men and women, be they soldiers, marines, sailors or airmen, have served extensively around the world. And you only have to visit them, see them on parade to, to understand that. And they have quite at times a humbling level of operational experience and a great deal of experience of the, the uncertainty and the conflict of the world. Some of the things they do are very brave, very courageous, and are equally as brave and courageous as their illustrious forebears in their units, be they ships, regiments, or aeroplanes. And you see that in the citations for bravery on the annual operations honors list. But perhaps more importantly, at a strategic discussion, we are very serious about learning and applying lessons uh, some of you may well be familiar with the phrase, our way in war. I don't think it's a particularly useful one nowadays. But there's certainly something about the British approach to the world we're in, the engagement opportunities our armed forces represent. So in my job as the commander of the Joint Forces Command, we have been working on the so what from that statement. And we've been working on a discrete paper, not necessarily highly classified, but not necessarily on the public record either, about how to adapt to that world. And we're now working on a, a new defense joint operating concept. And the big idea in that is to use the UK military instrument, the armed forces, as a contribution to the whole of government effort. Now, that's such an obvious thing to say, isn't it? But of course, we've come from a background where we, we were either subordinate to a grand strategy of NATO or another international body, but now that is very clear that that is what we are doing, contributing to a whole of government effort. Do this in a number of ways. The ones that I'll gloss over quite quickly because they're pretty easy to explain is our standing commitments. And of course, we also have, and I know, I'm sure this is well understood at Chatham House, 
we now have a def an overseas territories white paper, the first one for many years, and of course the armed forces are part of that in order to defend the overseas territories. Perhaps more exciting in a way, and uh, perhaps a little bit different, is we now have within the de defense joint operating concept the forward engagement approach to go to countries at their request, not at our insistence, but at their request to assist in capacity building and training and so on. Again, the brand, if you like, of the UK Armed Forces is strong, and a lot of countries want that support. And it might be as simple as border surveillance activity, training police forces, Coast Guard training. That's quite a high demand signal at the moment. And you might think this is all pinprick activity. Some of you may challenge me on it. But my word, if some of these countries had a better Coast Guard, had better border surveillance, had a better ability to understand what is going on and, on, on and around their borders, then obviously they're in a better place to guarantee their own national stability. So forward engagement is an important part of our construct, and we will do that by the use of our adaptive forces, be they Royal Navy, Royal Marines, Army, or Royal Air Force. Things go wrong, though. And as we've seen in the last decade, things go wrong sometimes quite quickly. So we'd still need to retain the harder edge, the ability to respond quickly and react. And we are very keen to do that in an international sense. This scene is changing quite fast. Now, one of the things Tim taught me when I was a, a young officer, uh, we call it flight lieutenant, the Navy call it uh, lieutenant, and the Army call it captain. I was flying an airplane called the Canberra, as Tim did, uh, and we operated all over the world. And Tim, of course, as a great internationalist, I think would have been pleased to hear me state that one of the things we're working on, I'm very passionate about, is putting NATO at the heart of UK defense. We have over 1,000 British personnel serving in NATO, in addition to those units that we allocate to NATO, and that's important. NATO has been, its demise may have even been predicted in this room following the end of the Cold War and other various ideas and crises that have been and gone. But I was at the major NATO event last week, and I can assure you NATO is alive and well. And, of course, we have very traditional allies. We all know who they are, United States in particular, and I will return in a minute to uh, the other thing I think Tim would have heartily approved of, which is our very close relationship now with the French, which we're working on. I am leading on the military segment of that, and it's real. And it is different in the sense of its depth, its, its automaticity, and this sort of uh, strengthening of our sharing activities. But we also need to reflect in this uncertain and ambiguous world that we need new partners as well. And we need other people to explain what is going on to deepen and help us with our understanding. And we saw during the Libyan operation the Royal Air Force flying with Arab Air Forces, for the first time in that sort of way. We've seen in, in Afghanistan 50 nations, 50 nations in the International Security and Assistance Force in Afghanistan. So you can see how these, the, the, the core of our activities still residing around NATO, but adapting the core alliance to meet the needs of other crises and, and crisis response. The way we do that, which is a, perhaps a bit different to other nations, is, I'm not going to say we're the world leaders, that would sound a bit too confident, but we're certainly very serious in Great Britain about joint action and joint activity. And that's why I say, I think Tim would have been very pleased with the fact, as a joint officer, I am very much a joint officer, that that is automatic. And it's very easy for copywriters and armchair generals to, to highlight differentiations between the single services. But if you go to Afghanistan, and if you go to other operations where one of the services is maybe the dominant force, they actually work together. And we're always stronger when we work together. We all rely on each other. We all are integrated at the right level. We deeply admire the tribes and the backgrounds, the ethos we come from, and that can be as competitive as you need it to be in an appropriate setting, but we are joint by definition. And many of our allies often quiz me and my colleagues and friends as how we manage to do that. The Joint Forces Command is a good example of that, where we now have 40,000 people under one command doing all the enabling for operations 
from the special side, the intelligence side, medical, uh, cyber, and so on. We're working closely with the French, as I said. The combined joint expeditionary force will go live in a year, a couple of years' time. And we're also working on an idea that David Richards, as the chief of defense staff, launched at Rusi at Christmas to embellish that and create a joint expeditionary force with other nations. That is very topical and very active work. I'm not going to tell you which nations they are yet because we, you know, we're still in uh, negotiation with some of them. But we are very serious about finding and working with new partners. And with one of those partners, for example, which I know would be welcomed in this sort of audience, is I work, for example, as the Vice Chief, as the Commander of Joint Forces Command, as the Chief of Joint Operations, very closely with both DFID and the Stabilization Unit. So the idea that there are these, all these little silos in the security sector in the UK, we're now very much integrated. And we're always looking for new ways to work closer together, develop our depth of understanding. Because there's one lesson from the last decade or so we need to be really honest about, and I think this would chime with Tim Sue, is understanding what you're doing, where you're going, and what is going on. Easy to say in a, an environment like this on a warm evening in London, but quite difficult in a tribal militia environment where people, several, several hundred groups in Syria at the moment, who is who in that terrible situation. So trying to develop those ideas, put meaning around them, work with friends and allies, and share information is exactly what we're trying to do. With those adaptive forces, and through being true to our friends in the world, and engaging on a persistent basis which we do and continue to do. And if there's a way of me trying to bring this to life, I'd say in my operational experience, continuous operational experience in the mid since the mid-90s, operations are now defined by complexity and not by scale. Anywhere there are conflicts, there are so many complications and complexities that we need to understand both the issues and indeed the constraints before we do anything. Have we always been good at that? I'm not sure. Uh, we're definitely learning and we're getting better at it. The constraints under which we operate are also important to be honest about. The relative power, I mentioned Asia at the beginning, the relative shift in balances is changing quite quickly. We must, must pay attention to public support. And public support is a very you know, hard thing to measure. And in a coalition, multinational environment, it may be very different between the members of that coalition, which becomes quite hard to manage in an operational setting. Many people like to talk, and I did listen very carefully when I was the head of operations and in my last job to organizations which I have the highest regard for, such as the ICRC, about the changing nature of international law. It's also very true to say, and I think it's an important point, that the, the sub-state groups that wish us harm and other extremist groups that wish us harm, pay no respect for symbols. And that's a very important point, and it's something for those who are interested in the ICRC. There's quite a lot of writing on this, and it has been a terrible time for the ICRC. They've lost a lot of people who are just trying to do the right thing and brave things. So this disrespect for symbols in an area where the disrespect for international law by sub-state groups is a very interesting and difficult situation. There's also the, the media, I know some of you are here tonight. All I say about that is the 24-7 nature of media is one issue. Another issue, of course, is if you are in a coalition environment or a complex environment and you're a long way from home, whose media are you dealing with? Because dealing with your own is one thing, but dealing with the media of those 50 nations in ISAF, as I think every commander of the International Security Assistance Force would tell you, is another matter. And I see a couple of people with a lot of operational experience in the room I think would agree with me. You have to take all this into account, which is precisely why professional military education, university education, and thinking about what you're doing and reading history is very important. The other thing I would now like to turn to, which is equally a, at times a constraint and at times an opportunity, and you can quiz me on this, because Tim wrote this very fresh book called The Technology Trap. We went through a phase in my military career, now spanning 40 years, 
where technology was always going to answer the difficult problem, wasn't it? But it always turns out to be a bit late, a bit more expensive than we, we were promised, and not quite as good. And of course, that phenomenon, which Tim wrote about in his book, he set himself the challenge in his preface of answering that, he thought, rather cynical phrase. And at the end, he concluded in this excellent book that we needed to do more to improve the technical knowledge of policymakers. What a fresh remark that is. And I would strongly associate myself with that remark. And we need to do more to integrate science, R&D, in a more sophisticated and mature way. And we are working on that right now in the Ministry of Defense. We also need to accept that pursuing exquisite technology to a sort of almost ridiculous extent will take you down the route to fewer and fewer platforms and ability to do very much at all. Tim wrote that in 1989, and it's true today. So equipment which is good enough is exactly what I'm sort of advocating and working on in my job, and I think Tim would agree. The other thing I think we should do more of in this complex and ambiguous and uncertain world is be prepared to experiment. And if you were to go and see the training that we now undertake for the brigades deploying to Afghanistan, you would be really struck, all of you, by how sophisticated it is, by how complicated it is, in order to prepare our boys and girls for what they're about to discover in Afghanistan. That's not by accident. It's taken us a while to get there, but it is now, many of you have been looking at, through the lights, many of you have experienced it. It is a very you know, sophisticated operation in and of itself. And therefore, that is an important point. But if you're going to do all that, you've also got to be prepared to be challenged and prepared to get it wrong and change. Again, I think Tim would agree. So what? Well, the UK Armed Forces, of course, refl reflect the society we in, we're in as well as the world. And we are changing quite quickly. We are very serious about defence reform. My, new, my former new command was very much a testament to that um, through the wisdom of Lord Levine and his report two years ago. And that now is, is going well. We are adapting. We're coping with that uncertainty. And we're also dealing with the austerity challenge. And that, of course, in my current post is, is very topical. So I think... It, it is very clear to me, and a very serious comment, Sue, is that Tim's legacy is very real. I can feel it. Tim's freshness of thinking, his positive energy he put into both the international scene and in his time in the Ministry of Defence and my own service has endured. And that, I think, is a tribute to the man and a great privilege to be asked to remember him. Thank you. <laughs>